All right, hello and welcome back to another episode of Just a Girl from Cleveland. This is episode 123. Um, both of my football teams won again this weekend, very exciting. Uh, don't mind my kind of scratchy, stuffy voice here. I was, as I mentioned, last episode in Indianapolis this past weekend for the Browns game. Got to see it in person uh, and then directly after the game made the drive back to Cleveland. So I'm still uh, physically, mentally recovering. Um, and I feel like anytime you uh, travel in that way, get a little scratchy, stuffy nose, all that stuff. Uh, so i uh, going to try to not have a coughing attack during this podcast. That is my, my main goal uh, here. But uh, yes, very exciting weekend for both Ohio State and the Browns. Ohio State beating Penn State, uh, one of their biggest opponents of the season. Um, I got to kind of watch a little bit of the end of the game on a phone in the car while I was driving to Indianapolis. Um, didn't get to watch the majority of the game, unfortunately, so can't, you know, ex extensively comment on it. But uh, I think anytime you have the opportunity to be a highly ranked team like that within the Big Ten, it's a, it's a huge deal. Um, and even when it's not, you know, perfect or pretty, uh, it's nice to see, uh, number one, the defense uh, showing up, which is a pattern, I think, this year with my football teams is uh, the defense showing up uh, when the offense can't. Um, so definitely a, a continued pattern there for the Buckeyes as well. Um, I think the bigger topic of conversation though in college football right now that I just kind of want to briefly touch on is the allegations against that team up north right now. Bunch of cheaters. Um, so, you know, the details are still kind of coming out about what is going on um, with the allegations against that university. Uh, and basically what it seems like is there's this guy named, I think Connor Stallions is his name. He's like a lower level employee within the team. And there, I, I don't know how this first came about, but there are reports of him basically buying tickets to other games for opponents that Michigan is going to have throughout the season and recording them, whether it's him or someone else. I think those details are still coming out more, um, but recording those and basically stealing signs in that way, which, um, you know, you're allowed to, you know, look for signs from other teams in other ways, but you cannot physically go and record them um, in that way. Uh, and that is what this guy was doing. Um, I think it's pretty obvious other people within this uh, organization and this university were involved with it uh, because this guy made like 55k a year and certainly was not buying himself tickets to like 30 football games throughout the course of, you know, time, you know, two years or however long he's been doing this. I'm not sure um, if I've seen those specific details either, but he's obviously not doing this on his own dime because that would be ridiculously expensive for him to do. There's also images of him on the sideline standing directly next to the offensive and defensive coordinator throughout the games, obviously probably giving them that information. Uh, usually an employee of that level is not going to be the ones directly next to those important people during a game. So seems pretty sus suspicious in that regard as well. Um, and look, I'm always down for a downfall of that team up north, but I think um, what I keep going back to is the way that not just those fans and that team, but really the entire college football world spoke about Ohio State during Tattoo Gate um, and the tattoo scandal of, gosh, how long was that now? 15, 20 years ago, I guess. Um, I probably like 15 years ago. I have no sense of time anymore. Um, but the way people acted like that was the worst thing that you could do in the entire world, like somehow they did something so egregious and so immoral and so awful. If anything's more immoral, it's definitely this not selling, um, or, or getting, um, tattoos in exchange. Like that, that was just like kind of a dumb mistake they made. This is like legitimate cheating that could affect an outcome of games. Like, I think we cannot really compare the two of these things. Um, so I just think it's funny that, um, you know, Michigan fans are very upset right now that people are saying anything, saying, hey, it's not a big deal. Everyone else is just mad that Michigan is good now, that they're beating Ohio State um, after many years of not beating them. 
Um, and I think that's just funny because they've been very hard on Ohio State for much lesser infractions uh, than what this is claiming to be. So don't really want to hear it from them in general. Uh, and I think if something has the potential to affect out an outcome of a game, um, it definitely needs to be investigated in that way. It um, is disrespectful to the game in general, and they're going to have to fully take a look at it if it's going against and the NCAA rules and what is allowed, then that is their problem, not my problem. I don't feel bad for them even a little bit. Um, so we'll see what happens. I think, you know, the story is continuing to evolve. Uh, so I will definitely talk about, on, uh, talk about it on here as things are updated. And I'm assuming a punishment will eventually be coming for, um, for them, whether it's taking away um wins they've I mean they've taken away bowl games from many 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 teams before in the past um taking away wins in general like those things have happened to quite a few teams including the Buckeyes so I wouldn't be surprised if we see something like that happen here okay so now to get into the Browns, um, because unlike the Buckeye game, I did get to watch every second of this game because I was there in person, uh, which was really exciting. Very cool uh, stadium. I really, really enjoyed uh, being there in that environment. I liked the kind of balance between having the dome and the seal, the ceiling not on the dome, so it was open, but then they had the windows on the sides on, so it kind of at least could insulate things a little bit. It was still definitely chilly in there, but it made it feel like more of a football environment, whereas sometimes when you're in a completely closed over dome, it feels a little bit less football-ish to me. Uh, so I thought for that reason, it was uh, kind of nice to have the balance, even though my hands were freezing the entire time. Um, but overall, great game day experience in there. I thought there were a ton more Browns fans than I realized in the moment. Um, I think from where I was sitting in my seats, it was hard to tell. And I think it's hard to tell in stadiums when the seats are a specific color like that. Like the seats were blue in there. So even when there were empty seats, it still felt like those were Colts fans. Uh, additionally, like when, like, I could tell the Browns fans that were in orange, obviously, very clearly. But if there's a Browns fan wearing white or brown, sometimes it's harder to tell in the crowd, especially white. That could be Colts from a distance, you know, I don't know. And then brown is such a neutral color that it kind of could look black or, I don't know, just blends in more in the crowd. Um, so it was kind of hard for me to tell. But you could tell a lot more in the stadium and also on the broadcast uh, when you would hear the Miles Carrot <laughs> um, chants going on throughout that stadium, as well as the barking that was continuously going on throughout the game, I thought um, the you know fans really showed up in a nice way, and um, it was fun just to to see everyone cheering and feel like you were still a part of a community there, even on the road. It was really fun. Uh, and I think the players are always appreciative of that. And I think it really helps motivate the team in a different way when they have the fans behind them like that. It was, you know, a four and a half ish hour drive from Cleveland. So not too bad for people to make it over there. Uh, and that was, um, yeah, the Miles Garrett chants really were, were really cool. And I hope he heard those and, and felt um, appreciated in that moment because he definitely deserved it, which we're going to get into um, in this episode for sure. Okay, so I'll start off with some of the highlights of the game. Because look, we won 39 to 38. Wasn't pretty, but we won. So we're going to start with some of the positives. Um, and we'll start with the three guys who got game balls this game. Dustin Hopkins, Kareem Hunt, and Miles Garrett. So Dustin Hopkins, I mean, who would have thought that after all of the kicker controversy of the preseason, we would be sitting in this position where we have one of the most trusted kickers in the league who... I think it was five weeks in a row has made a 50 plus yard field goal, um, which is extremely impressive considering the criticisms criticisms of him as a kicker was that he was not able to make the long kicks and that people were afraid that he didn't have the distance. Uh, meanwhile, he's consistently making these 50 plus yarders, uh, one of them being a 58 yarder this week that was his career long uh, make, which is so awesome for him. Really excited, four for four overall on the game. Uh, we just really needed, I think, that boost 
throughout to just uh, keep plugging away as the game felt like it was uh, kind of out of control. That was a, one of the main consistents throughout. Uh, and, you know, I look, I feel bad for Cade York and how everything went, but uh, I would not have trusted Cade York in these situations. And I'm really happy that we have someone else in there right now. So feels pretty good. Uh, Kareem Hunt uh, also got a game ball. Two touchdowns for him, including the game-winning score uh, down at the, the very end there. You know, he really stepped up in a way when Jerome Ford went to the locker room. I don't remember what quarter that happened in, but uh, it felt like, okay, we already lost Nick Chubb this season. Jerome Ford's headed to the locker room. Kareem Hunt just joined the team two weeks ago, but get ready. Come on, step up, buddy. Um, and he, he did. He was fighting through a thigh injury as well. So I can't imagine that was comfortable for him, but he did, you know, what he needed to do to get things done. And I, I was happy for him for that. It feels like even though he doesn't have the same qualities that he used to have as a running back in his very prime, he still can fight through and get that little bit of extra. Um, I think he's still a good, a decent red zone, red zone running back. Uh, so I feel, feel really happy for him that that was how that game went. And then lastly, Miles Garrett, um, one of the most dominant performances I have seen from an athlete in my entire life. And I, I'm not saying that as like a hyperbole, like I actually mean that there are few performances that I have watched in my life that made me like drop my jaw in the way watching Miles Garrett in this game did. He had two sacks, two QB hits, and one blocked field goal. Um, was just flying all over the field at all times, was responsible for at least two of the Brown scores himself. The blocked field goal was the greatest moment of athleticism that I have witnessed in my entire life. Um, you know, players don't usually try to do that because if when you're jumping over the line, you touch them, it's a penalty. Uh, so I think most guys assume that they are not going to be able to jump over the line because who can do that? That's an insane thing to do. Miles Garrett can. He was able to jump over them and not just do that, but after quickly landing, go right back up and be able to block the field goal. Uh, it was going to be like a 60 yarder or something, uh, which was crazy, but he was able to just explode back up into the air, which I, that, like you can only do that usually with a running start or something. It was just insane to watch him do that. Um, and then to be able to make that play was, was really, really cool. Um, and I'm, I'm just so happy for the year he's having and feel like if he continues to do what he's doing, I will be so disappointed if he does not win defensive player of the year, because it is definitely, definitely deserved. Um, this also just makes me think of all the conversations that are constantly going on on social media and everywhere about TJ Watt versus Miles Garrett. And I, I saw a lot of discourse about it today, and I'm, I'm very much in agreement that I think Steelers fans care way more about Miles Garrett and talk way more about Miles Garrett than Browns fans do about TJ Watt. We're just kind of like, yeah, TJ Watt's a good player, but we're not like upset by his presence all of the time. And Miles really gets to Steelers fans in a very hilarious way. And I just think that shows how good he is because if he wasn't that good, he wouldn't bother them that much. Uh, and he definitely does. Uh, look, both incredible athletes and really good at what they do. Uh, but God, Miles is just, he is something, something really special. Okay, so got to get into a little bit of the negative. We're going to talk about the quarterback position. It is so unfortunate that with all of the different assets on this team right now, that the quarterback position is the thing that seems like it's going to be their downfall after they spent so much money on, on it two off seasons ago. It is just beyond frustrating. So this week, Deshaun was one of five with one interception. The final pass he took was about to be another interception if the guy didn't drop it. Um, and then he went out of the game. PJ Walker came in 15 to 32 with one interception. Very average stat line. He had a lot of, you know, rough moments, but then he had like the one amazing throw to Elijah Moore down the sideline, like a 30 yard dot perfect throw. Uh, and he is really just that kind of guy where, where he'll just do a couple dumb things and then he'll have one really incredible throw. Like he has the capability to make those high end plays. 
um, which kind of makes him, you know, still special and serviceable in this league. But then the bad moments are definitely a struggle as well in some of the not so smart plays. Um, right before I started recording this, it came out that uh, there was a little bit more clarity. I, if you want to call it clarity, I don't know, because it feels like we've been getting clarity for the last four weeks about this injury. Um, but Adam Schefter said some clarity on Deshaun Watson's injury. Doctors told him that he has a strain of the subcapularis with the rotator cuff, and he continues to have both pain and weakness with movement. This type of injury in baseball normally causes pitchers to miss four to six weeks. Watson continues to work to regain strength and velocity in his shoulder and shorten that window. It just, like, at one point we heard two to six weeks, now we hear four to six weeks. I I feel like this, I don't I don't know if I've seen this subscapularis <laughs> word before thrown in there with the rotator cuff. I, I'm genuinely confused with what has been going on with this injury. It was extremely weird in this game to watch. After they cleared him, they took him into the tent for a concussion protocol, cleared him, and they didn't bring him back in the game because they didn't want to risk him getting hit. I'm just confused on why he was in the game in the first place. Like, I really don't understand why you put him out there if five plays later you're afraid of him getting hit. Um, and, like, it, it is, it's just frustrating to just not have answers. And I really understand why Browns fans are feeling so weary of this conversation because it feels like the front office, coaching staff, and quarterback are not all speaking the same language when it comes to this injury. And it's been very up and down. After the game, Stefanski said, Watson's going to be the starter um, in Seattle. And then the next day, he's like, he's day to day. So how do you know he's going to be the starter? Like the messaging is just so inconsistent from day to day, from week to week. Um, and it feels frustrating and it feels very reminiscent of Baker Mayfield, which is why Browns fans are so upset about it. And I very much understand that. It derailed an entire season that we had major playoff hopes for was a shoulder injury that was not um, you know, communicated clearly to the fans throughout the season. And it feels like we're just in that place again, uh, this time with a $230 million quarterback. And it's really frustrating. And a quarterback that you really want some clear answers on, on if he is a guy still or not. Like, you still don't know that. He's had... A, you know, a really nice game against the Titans and we haven't gotten to see him play a normal game since then. So you still have no clarity on who he is as a player at this point in his career. And it's, it's really frustrating. Um, so I, I empathize with all Browns fans that are feeling this way right now. Um, and, you know, anyone who's trying to downplay it and be like, oh, you guys are being dramatic. No, this is frustrating to be in this place again where we just don't know when we're going to have our quarterback. And we don't know if it's going to affect him for the rest of the season. This could be something that lingers for him the rest of the season. And um, that is really tough. I think a tough pill to swallow for Browns fans, uh, just knowing the talent the level of talent on this team and what everyone felt like this season could really be after watching the way this defense has showed up these first couple weeks, the way our kicker can't miss, uh, the way we have some great offensive weapons, even though Nick Chubb went down, still guys fighting every day, guys on the offensive line, Dewan Jones stepping up, you know, even when the offensive line is banged up. So it, it is, it's frustrating to watch and uh, I understand all of the frustration surrounding it. Um, okay, so some more specifics, I guess, with the game. Actually, one other negative before I get into some of the other specifics. The defense, um, although had some like really incredible plays uh, and still had the flashes of what they were, obviously were giving up some explosive plays. Uh, and I think I saw something that um, had a percentage of zone that they played in this game, uh, it being similar to the amount of zone that they played in the Ravens game. Uh, and obviously I think man to man has been much more of their strong suit. They really excelled at that against the 49ers. And, um, I just think have had less miscommunications in that way. And I think some of the miscommunications are still happening when they're in zone. So, uh, something to definitely look at, um, just as we're moving forward. And I know it very much depends on opponent on how they decide to do things. Uh, so I think, the defense might continue to have some of those up and down moments uh, based on who they are playing uh, and just how they have to face that type of offense. Uh, because it was pretty crazy to like make Gardner Minshew kind of look like a good quarterback again. Gardner Minshew, not a good quarterback. Like we, we don't need to make him look good. That was a, a little bit crazy. 
Um, okay. So a couple other thoughts, like I said, um, you know, there were those couple calls at the end that are, have been the big to national topic of conversation from this game. I, as a lifelong Browns fan, have not spent one second of my time feeling bad about a single call made in that game that might have been questionable and went in the Browns' favor. I have not spent, not even in the moment, there was not one second where I was like, oh, that, I, uh, I feel bad about that. And I feel like, you know, the Colts really should have won that game. No, I, I don't feel a little bit bad because the Browns have been a tortured team my entire life at the hands of the refs. And they have ruined so many games in my lifetime on bad calls made towards the Browns. We had a bad call in the game against the Chiefs in the playoffs in 2020 that pretty much ruined our chances of winning that game. Of course, we made mistakes but everyone knows what I'm talking about, ruined our chances of winning that game. We have had pass interference calls for many years, one specifically against the Chargers two years ago that still plagues me because my Apple Watch told me my heart rate was too high because I was very upset with the refs for a stupid pass interference call that ruined the game for the Browns. I am not going to spend any of my time talking about the refs in this game because it is about time that the Browns get one or two calls that go their way so that they can win one of these stupid football games that everyone else always gets to win. How many times do the Steelers get to win a stupid football game? It feels like every single week. I do not feel bad about winning this game. The Browns are four and two, and it is the same four and two as anyone else's four and two. A win counts as one win, and we are moving forward with it. And I don't want to hear anything else about the refs because it doesn't matter to me. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, <laughs> in general, um, what else do we have? Dewan Jones, I mentioned him briefly there, um, did a really nice job, I think, in this game. And I've been thinking about his play a lot lately, uh, in general, and just the fact that he is a fourth round pick and has stepped in the way he has. I think this needs to be something that is regularly talked about with Andrew Barry's draft picks as much as all of his missed draft picks have been talked about. I think this is just as important to speak on. So uh, really amazing that they were able to get him in such a, a later round in the draft and already getting this much production out of him. I think he has so much further to go to in his development that he could be a really solid piece of this Browns offensive line for, for many, many years to come, uh, which is really, really exciting. Um, and then I think the last thing I want to touch on with the game is Kevin, because um, there's always conversations about Kevin. I think Kevin deserves um, props for what he was able to string together in this game with the pieces that he had. Um, losing your quarterback after five plays, and albeit he took him out because he didn't want to injure him further, so it was a choice he made, but knowing that the QB1 position is just been up in the air for weeks, having P.J. Walker... Um, being able to score 39 points. I know the defense was responsible for a lot of it and kicking was responsible for a lot of it, but being able to put that much on the board with what we strung together in this game, I think it is a testament to him and is, is definitely impressive. Um, and I think one of the bigger discussions in the game was that last drive that we had where Kareem scored. And look, when I was watching the game in the moment, I feel like sometimes it's hard to digest everything because I'm so emotional in the moment. And I'll be like, what are we doing? We just need to score. What are we doing? You know, um, I'm not thinking about things as um, critically in that moment. But uh, looking back at it, I'm actually not upset with the way he called those last couple of plays at the end there. Um, Knowing that the clock was running down, I think a huge part of that that a lot of people weren't thinking about in the moment was the clock management of that moment because you want to be able to use all four downs. You want four chances to score in that moment. And if you run the ball, uh, you might not have those four chances to score. So if you run it and you don't get it on the first play, you are really risking your ability to score again in that moment with the clock running down. Uh, so I think passing was you know the smart move to start off uh, in those first couple of plays. Obviously didn't get it, which is very stressful. Then on fourth down was able to get it with running Kareem Hunt um, and left um, nearly no time on the clock. I think 15 seconds were left at that point. 
Um, so I think it, it's a really hard balancing act as a coach. And I think that's one of the hardest things that you have to do as a coach is, is manage the clock and manage the number of opportunities you're going to get in a close game. Uh, I, I think balancing those two things is, is nearly impossible just in the heat of the moment. Uh, and looking back at it, I think he actually did a really nice job with that, giving them all of those four attempts. Obviously, you would have liked for them to get it earlier to uh, get rid of some of the stress of the moment, but that didn't happen. So uh, it is what it is. But uh, I think overall, Kevin deserves a lot of credit for what he was able to do this, this week, what he was able to do last week against the 49ers. I think uh, it is, it's not easy to go out there with a PJ Walker and do what he's been doing. So it's it's special for sure and should be noted um, even when he isn't perfect. Uh, okay, so that is all I have for you guys today. We have Seattle coming up. Uh, once again, I'm going to be in Seattle for the Browns game, uh, traveling all the way out to the West uh, for the weekend to watch them play. So I'm really excited about that. Hopefully it'll be another win. Have no idea who is playing at quarterback. Don't even care. I'm just hoping for a win. We'll have a good time either way. Um, if any of you are out there, definitely um, say hi if you see me. And um, hopefully we're going five and two. We'll see. Who knows? Uh, we'll take it though. Thank you guys so much for listening. And go Browns.